Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to the Aquifer Educator to Educator webinar. Uh, we'll be talking about best practices in using Aquifer in flipped classrooms today. Um, and so glad that you joined us. I hope that you uh, learned some uh, new and interesting things with us here today. So here are our panelists. I'm Sherilyn Smith, uh, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer for Aquifer. Um, I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington, and my role there is a clinical skills learning specialist. Um, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Pauline Germain, who is the Vice Chair of uh, Research and Education in Radiology at the Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. Uh, Sarah Kraus is joining us as well. Um, she's an assistant professor and academic coordinator for the Physician Assistant Program at the School of Medicine um, at, Case, at the Case Western, the Case Western, right, University, uh, Western Reserve University. And Andrew Parson um, is also uh, an, uh, joining us, and he's an assistant professor of, um, whoops, sorry, uh, sorry, but sorry, 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 Andrew, uh, assistant professor of um, medicine and public health and the director of the pre-clerkship coaching and clinical skills program at the University of Virginia. And so I'm a little jealous about that coaching part. Uh, it's uh, super cool. So um, a little disclaimer, um, I am uh, received salary support uh, for my role at uh, Aquifer as the chief academic officer. And Dr. Jermaine is a member of the Aquifer Educators Consortium and receives an annual honorarium for her work. So here are our learning goals today. Uh, we're going to review the benefits for using a flipped classroom approach in healthcare professions education. Uh, we're gonna discuss a framework that will help you choose strategies to implement when you're using this approach for teaching. We're gonna share advice from expert faculty on how they use aquifer courses in flipped classrooms. And then we're gonna review some resources to really help you and get you started um, in your journey to, to using aquifer in this uh, educational approach. So here's our agenda. We'll be uh, doing a little bit of introduction, which we're doing right now. Then uh, turning to why use the flipped classroom approach and some strategies. Uh, <clears throat> I'll review uh, very briefly uh, so you can find the aquifer resources that we'll be talking about in the flipped classroom sessions. Then we'll have our panels talk to panelists talk about what they do and what their secrets are. And then we'll end up with your questions and hopefully our answers, and then a wrap up and some resources that you can uh, take away. So a couple of logistics notes, make sure that you put your questions uh, for us in the Q&A panel. So there's a little button on your Zoom uh, for that. Other questions can be uh, answered uh, online, put them in the chat. We're happy to um, answer those questions uh, and uh, we'll be doing that uh, throughout the webinar. All right. So we're ready for our first poll. Um, so um, we're gonna open this up. And what kind of active teaching strategies are you using? So check all that apply. Um, and we're, I'm super interested in finding out what, what kinds of things you've um, experimented with. Um, And I know you all are racing to fill it in and we're gonna find out the results. So wonderful. So um, here are the different types of strategies. So almost all of you are doing case uh, discussions, which is really great. Team-based learning, 50% of uh, respondents. So that's really awesome. Journal club, flipped classroom. So some of you are already doing this. So I hope that uh, we can uh, build on what you're doing and you can share your wisdom with us. Uh, response questions, quizzes, a great, a great way to, um, to really uh, uh, share um, what you've uh, learned and, and to really reinforce student learning. And then uh, a smaller number of you was really team projects. So I think that that's, that's uh, totally awesome. So thank you for sharing that. And if you have innovations that you wanna share, um, put them in the Q&A because we would like to learn from you. So a little bit about Aquifer, if you don't know who we are, just a brief overview, we're a not-for-profit um, and we're dedicated to delivering the best healthcare um, education 
through collaborative development and research into innovative high, high impact virtual teaching and learning uh, methods. And we've been at this for more than 20 years. We started as part of a grant uh, from HRSA in pediatrics. And so this is all made possible by our work with a, a bunch of really great academic collaborators. Uh, more than 65 people are, uh, compose our uh, consortium. And I will tell you that there are so many more people who are involved in updating the cases, making sure the content is correct, writing assessment questions, really thinking about innovative ways to integrate and have others um, use uh, Aquifer in uh, their uh, own curriculum. We partner with um, a variety of educational organizations and our pledge is to comprehensively cover the curriculum of our partners. And so you can see here, uh, with pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine, geriatrics and radiology, as well as the International Association of Medical Science Educators or Basic Scientists. Um, and through our partnerships, we also give back uh, to support their research into um, innovative um, advances in healthcare professions education. And so if you haven't been into a case, our real focus for Aquifer is really developing the clinical reasoning skills of the people who use the cases. And each case works through an authentic manner, having the student um, gather history, work through physical exam, abstract the information they need, create a differential diagnosis, commit to uh, what they're gonna do for their diagnosis and treatment plan, and then learn more about management and work through that. And it really highlights really deep content, again, from our national um, educational partners, uh, we uh, foster knowledge acquisition, we model behavior that we hope every clinician will do uh, throughout the cases, and we really um, think that this is a great preparation to be an excellent practitioner, and that's really our goal. And so in the last um, academic year, 2019 through 2020, um, you can see the type of impact that we've had. Um, more than, as I said, there are a lot of people who contributed this, more than 300 academic uh, contributors, really making sure that we uh, can provide you all with uh, great quality uh, content to work with. Um, and we gave back uh, more than a million dollars in grants to help uh, schools sort of navigate the pandemic and then use all of the different content we have in, uh, through, um, in all of our courses. So um, why use the flipped classroom approach? Um, what is the theory behind doing this? And what is the evidence? And so really the benefits to flipping your classroom um, is better short-term student learning outcomes. We know that for sure, uh, compared to, to other types of learning like independent uh, learning, reading um, and lecture for sure. Um, there's increased student teacher interaction, which I think is one of the things that we all love as educators more practice with problem solving. So you're actually able to create uh, learning situations where you can really elevate your students' uh, learning that's sometimes really hard to do in other types of uh, uh, educational se uh, settings. More collaborative time for students to help build their uh, team approach. And then more opportunities for students to learn at their own pace. So again, um, having out of class uh, time to work on their, with their materials uh, really can foster that. What are some of the challenges? And I think that uh, many of you all know these challenges. There's uh, potentially increased workload outside of class. So that's one of the things that you have to think about when you're creating your whole curriculum. Group activities can in in increase stress in certain students. And I would say sometimes in Zoom. So we have to be aware of that and monitor those group dynamics. Students with limited access to technology outside the classroom can be at a, a disadvantage, and I think that we've seen that with COVID um, and some of the disruptions that we've had. Lack of preparation may decrease um, in-person teaching effectiveness. Um, and so having people show up and not have done the homework can sometimes get in the way. So I have planned for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I think that, you know, we you think through that and what's the likelihood that they'll actually do the um, the activities beforehand. And then uh, teacher preparation may be increased, but we hope that we're gonna share some tools that can decrease the amount of time that you need to prepare uh, to have fun with your students and help them learn. Some, some strategies to optimize the flipping um, is I would say building on the benefits is choose the goals that uh, for the session that require synthesis, analysis, or application. So those higher level goals, not recall, uh, not describing those types of things. Plan for interactivity 
between group participants, okay? So it's not just you and the students, but it's, it's between them and how are you gonna set that up? Build on the homework, make sure that you link to it uh, because if they do a bunch of things beforehand, especially the first time and you never reference it, they're gonna think, oh, I don't need to do the homework. Mix in assessment of knowledge because lots of times students really want to know that they've learned that the content that they have uh, worked on before. And, and then the last thing is don't use too many teaching methods. So as particularly in a session, because there's some cognitive time for them to like understand what, what do I need to do here? And you're gonna have to spend your time explaining what the activity is if you switch uh, between methodologies. Um, here are some of the teaching approach. So it goes back to our, our um, uh, list. And you all, um, I would say a lot of you have experimented with this. Um, and so I hope that you're ready. This is fertile ground to, to bring in uh, what aquifer, how aquifer can help um, you do this. <clears throat> I really like the student-led instruction, um, although I'm always a little suspicious. It, it's like when I was a stu medical student and the attending said, go read about it and come back and teach me about it. I was like, are you serious? Like, aren't you the expert? Uh, but that was me being a medical student. So it's a super great way for uh, learning. And I know that I learned really well during that time. So what I'm going to do now is uh, get out of my slides uh, for just a second and show you uh, where uh, you can find some of our, um, our tools. So where I am now is in Aqueduct. So if you log in um, to our learning platform, um, this is where you'll land um, as an educator. And you can see that we'll have courses and right at the very top um, in all these nice colors are where you can go to find educator resources. And so if you click on the educator resource button, and I'm just going to show you, give you a little overview so you can know what's there. Um, we have a listing of all of our courses and every course has an educator guide. So it's an overview of the cases and um, what's in them. So that's standard across all of our um, courses. And for diagnostic excellence, high value care, pediatrics and radiology, they're, they're specific tools, and you're gonna get to see some of those in action uh, that you can use to flip your classroom. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna dive into pediatrics. I'm a pediatrician, and so I know these the best, but you're gonna get to hear uh, from um, others. And so as I mentioned, the educator guide and quick case guide are right here to, to give you an idea about the content. And then we have active learning modules, and I may have a chance to talk a little bit about the active learning modules. Uh, and, and so here is the listing of all of the tools that we have. And I'm just gonna highlight um, this just really quickly. The case analysis tool that you are gonna be um, hearing more about later can be used with any aquifer case. So that's one of the cool things about um, Aquifer is that we have tools that can be used across all of um, our cases um, and courses. <clears throat> so back. So that's a quick overview of where you can find things. It's a little snippet to say, hmm, uh, I wonder what's, what's there for me in my content. So we've got another poll that's gonna get us ready for our panel discussion. So, really interested, I list out possible barriers, but what struggles do you currently face or anticipate in implementing flipped classroom approaches? And we'll take particular note of this, all of the panelists are uh, gonna wait with bated breath uh, to find out what, the, what your um, current struggles are and hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, help you with some of these. All right, so the number one choice is time. I am not surprised. So 72% of you all 
uh, said that that's time to create the teaching materials. And I will say that, yes, um, that is a, a big barrier. Um, uh, tied for almost exactly the same, about 50% of you are saying faculty training, um, strategies to engage the students real time. So being able to, you've got a great plan, but then what happens uh, when you're actually in the setting? And then time in the curriculum to implement flipped classroom workshops, great. So those are the top uh, things. Um, motivation for independent work uh, for students, I guess, is, is uh, close. So I think that with that, maybe panelists look at that uh, and then we can loop back around and think about like how we can help out with that. Great. So here we are, we're coming to our panelists, the flipped classrooms in practice. And we're gonna start with uh, Dr. Jermaine and she's gonna tell us a bit about the radiology um, workshop. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and Pauline, just let me know when I need to advance um, and keep you on track. Sounds good, thank you. Hello everybody and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Pauline Germain, I'm the Vice Chair of Research and Education, but I am also a radiology clerkship director and so I do a lot with our students. In my former life, I had the shorter hair, hence the bit of a disconnect between my photograph and the reality, but I guess it's typical these days. So we'll skip this slide if it's okay. The only thing I will say on this slide is uh, a photograph on the side is um, an image of some of the case workshops that are available on the educator resources page that Sherilyn um, directed you to. And each workshop, at least for radiology, comes with the um, PowerPoint presentation as well as speaker notes. So that is supposed to really be helpful in terms of timing to create the educational resources for your faculty and um, the resources also contain the helpful questions. So we'll dive in. If we could advance to the next slide, please. Um, this is a um, sort of one of the ways that you can incorporate radiology into the teaching in other disciplines. And it's a fun and interactive way. So if you're teaching pediatrics, as Sherilyn just highlighted, there are radiology specific cases in um, radiology targeting pediatrics that you can refer to. So we've tried to be mindful of other disciplines and hopefully you will find this as a helpful resource to tap into the radiology um, educators resources to help with your own curricula. If we could advance to the next slide, please. So how do we do it? I am going to talk to you about the radiology resin bootcamp. So it's not really medical student geared per se, but we use the resources geared for medical students to create a bootcamp for our radiology residents. Our incoming uh, residents come from different programs, have varied levels of knowledge in radiology education in their training. Only 25% of medical schools have radiology as a required clerkships. So we use the aquifer radiology cases to provide the solid foundation of basic knowledge for our incoming residents, leveling the playing field for all of them at once and giving them an opportunity to become active participants in the daily life of the radiology room uh, in the radiology reading room and we use the radiology resources uh, available in aquifer for that. We use our senior residents, usually our three or our four level residents, and they teach our incoming residents the basics of radiology. The sessions are short. They're based on the assigned cases from the radiology case collection that's available in aquifer. The first year residents review these cases ahead of the workshop. Our moderators who are our senior residents, these are easy to prepare and run as each case comes uh, with workshop PowerPoints and the speaker notes that I pointed out to you previously. And this is just sort of a um, reference to the first workshop that is available in radiology. The uh, speaker notes are easily accessible on the website on the, under the educator resources. For senior residents who are running this workshop for us, these activities help reinforce basic concepts that we hope they know, but it's just another opportunity to reinforce those basic concepts. They uh, engage in learning and sharing the knowledge that they already have with the first year residents, engaging them with questions that are available in speaker nodes, directing them specifically what questions to ask. 
Not only do they share their knowledge, the residents, the first year residents acquire some basic knowledge, but these sessions also serve as a bonding activity for the first year class that is just starting out. They're figuring out where they stand in the radiology world. And they also serve as reinforcement for our senior residents. They, these workshops, when it comes to our senior residents, are also a window into an academic medicine. They figure out if they like to teach. Do they like this type of interaction? Because at this point, they're trying to figure out, should they stay in the academic medicine or are they going to uh, into private practice? So it's also a worthwhile sort of side benefit from this activity. If we could advance to the next slide, please. The workshops are image rich. Um, they come with numerous excellent images and examples. Thank you very much. Um, our learners, our first year residents, develop the rich visual as well as verbal imaging vocabularies as part of these exercises while reinforcing the key concepts from each of the companion cases. Next slide, please. I've mentioned that there are presenter slides. So presenter slides and presenters notes have not only the answers and descriptions for each of the findings that are shown in the images, but they also have um, questions that I've mentioned that prompt the learners um, along the way. Let's say maybe the learners did not see the findings. So the speaker who's running the workshop can say, well, what do you think about the right diaphragm? Does that look okay to you? And then there are answers directing them to discussion as to what the answer should be. So super helpful. Um, next slide, please. This, these past months, now a year, we have spent a lot of time, whether it be Zoom, WebEx, on the computers, we're constantly on our computers and devices. For radiologists, we're always on the computers. So this Zoom fatigue and Zoom exhaust, exhaustion is really compounded because we're on the computers all day long. These workshops helped us engage not just the learners, not just our first year residents in this case when it comes to boot camp, but they also helped engage our faculty. We didn't skip a beat by not providing this opportunity of boot camp just because we were limited and not able to be in the same room all the time. So these workshops gave us that opportunity to meet the first year class, to continue with our educational and learning activities for our senior residents, for our attendings, and for our incoming residents. Um, we know that the quality of our attention on the computers is really different from when, when we're in person together in the same room. So we have tons of distractions, whether it be emails or texts or phones are always buzzing and dinging. Um, so we found that by keeping our cameras on, always asking questions, taking perhaps um, side trips if the learners saw something else that maybe they needed clarification on, and then regrouping back on the activities that are in the guide and in the case help us continue with the workflow and continued engagement. Having that camera on definitely is a must. Uh, the chat box uh, may or may not be helpful. Uh, it may be a bit of a distraction at times if you're the only one running, but they're helpful for the learners to put in the questions if they have something that they need immediate answers on. Many days during this academic year, we were separated by time and space, but having these workshops that are already made and easily accessible allowed us to continue with our boot camp without interruption, gave us a sense of some sort of normalcy and allowed us to move forward with our educational mission for this class um, and for our medical students, because we still use them for our medical students as well. Um, so that's all I have. And I hope that um, to answer any of your questions down the line. Thank you. Oh, that was awesome, Pauline. Of course, I get so jealous every time I, I know all of the work that you put into these workshops. And so I was a, a pediatric clerkship director before I have my, my um, you know, current role. And so I'm just, I want to make sure that I get this right. So um, if my school, you know, and, and the University of Washington subscribes to all of these. So as, as long as my school subscribes to radiology, as a pediatric clerkship director, I could just go in get these to find a resident, a faculty, give this to them in advance and say, I'd just like you to do a couple of sessions around radiology. Uh, did I get that right? 
Yep, absolutely. And um, these uh, workshops, as you have mentioned, have been created by the radiologists for radiologists, but they're super helpful for our referring colleagues as well. And so to continue with the example of a pediatrician, for example, we have wonderful images on pediatric hip and ultrasound of the pediatric hip and evaluation of any hip issues, which may fit in into the lecture topics that you're running in your clerkship. Great. And so I don't have to be a radiologist because you've given me great notes and yeah. then maybe my residents would actually learn about this. This is super cool, Pauline. Thank you for sharing. Um, so now we're going to turn to Sarah um, and she's going to share and I'm going to drive. Great. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for um, introducing me, Dr. Smith. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is something that my colleagues and I have implemented for our preclinical students in the PA program at Case Western. Um, so you move, uh, next slide, please. So we chose to um, specifically integrate Aquifer in a very dedicated and thoughtful way into our pediatrics course because we um, we recognize this as, as a course that our students tend to be a little bit intimidated by. And we and at the same time, we recognize aquifer courses as a way to help them gain um, some independence in their clinical reasoning skills, some confidence in their ability to interview patients and kind of explore the patient encounter in a way that it just presenting them a case and talking about a case discussion in class doesn't really enforce as much. So we were really excited. We, we wanted to avoid lecture um, because they have, they've got a lot of lecture in the fall. This is a course we do in the spring. So again, we wanted to really provide our students with an opportunity to kind of explore their experience with um, patients and get them used to manipulating the information that they gain from uh, patient encounters on their own. So the actual course is mixed. There's, there's eight sessions and we use four of them um, are strictly aquifer um, dedicated, but I have to say they are my favorite um, four sessions during this course because you just really see these, their students' clinical reasoning skills kind of blossom throughout. Um, you can move to the next page and I'll, I'll kind of... Um, explain there. So we, for the aquifer portion of this course, we heavily rely on the case analysis tool to help us communicate with the students. Um, so this is something that I actually stumbled across when we were exploring how to use aquifer um, in a more robust way in this, in this course. And it was, it was like a dream come true to have this um, resource, to have stumbled on this resource. Um, and really what it does is, is helps the student organize facts. Um, I think I, I would imagine that most um, people who are teaching early learners in medicine and nursing would agree that as students are acquiring information, organization is a huge component to their ability to think logically and, and develop their clinical reasoning. And this, this allows them to do it. Um, and so you can see on this tool, they, it's, it's really not, there's not a ton of direction. It's more just about organization. Um, and the way that these evolve, um, the way that we see that the, the students evolve is, is they, they start to really take ownership of their rationales. Um, they start to really take ownership of their um, exam and history findings. Because um, instead of just discussing them and having kind of a loose discussion, they are really, re really cementing their thoughts on the case. Um, so it's, it's really nice. We, I just finished grading the first one. Um, they did a dermatology case um, in the pediatrics cases. And everybody says, rash, rash, rash. You know, it, a, a few students here or there will give me a beautiful explanation of how, um, you know, how to treat and, and all of these great, uh, and this great advice for the patient's parent and, and how to treat the, the patient. But most of the people say, this is a rash. And then in six weeks, we're gonna have a similar case and it's just gonna be this beautiful description of a, you know, a finding and it's just a wonderful way to, to see them grow in that sense. So I also want to say that we use keys. There are keys to these case analysis tools posted on Aquifer. Not every case has a key, 
But the way I've been using the keys um, most effectively is I see kind of the suggested way to use it. And then I extrapolate that to the other cases that we do. So it's, it, it is, it does take a lot of input to grade these um, in the beginning, but once you kind of understand what they need, what needs to be put in there. And then once the students start to develop their um, clinical reasoning skill, it really becomes um, like clockwork to grade these. Um, so the other thing about the session that we really, we found important was to make sure um, we do a one hour lecture where we cover some don't miss diagnoses. We make sure that students kind of understand that. Um, we use the pants blueprint, um, which is the outline of um, items on the, the PA boards exam to help um, kind of guide that. But we really do rely on aqua for it. Really the differential that's included in those cases really does help the students. And it, it really fills in the gaps of the blueprints. Um, so the lecture is more of an opportunity for discussion versus necessarily us needing to cover um, a significant number of um, topics. Um, I also use the lecture during this point um, in, in their learning to discuss counseling points, especially with pediatrics. Again, I think our students um, sometimes need a little bit of extra emphasis on the importance of counseling, um, expectant management for parents, et cetera. Um, and then the students, so the students complete this case after that lecture. So we do give them a lot of context um, it, because we want them, we really want them to be successful in these case analysis tools, um, but they are completing them on their own. And then they get, and I grade each one and give them feedback. And I, like I said, it's usually a significant amount of feedback in the beginning. But um, by the end, I'm learning some points that they have found in their independent research. So it's great. Um, so the yeah, next slide is great. So we've done this one year. Um, we don't have a lot of data in terms of um, how the end of rotation exams um, have gone for pediatrics or the pediatric uh, rotations in their clinical year have gone. Um, just nothing really has changed yet. Um, but Qualitatively, the faculty absolutely love these case analysis tools. They're fun to grade, um, really, because just to see, it allows students who don't necessarily want to speak up in um, situations like problem-based learning sessions or team-based learning sessions to really show you their, their ability to create these plans and understand diagnostic tools and research new things that we didn't necessarily cover in class. So I think it brings out um, some of the really cool aspects of um, student interaction and learning um, through grading them. So I, 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 I actually enjoy it. It does take a lot of time though, but it is great. Um, and then um, the students end, end up liking them a lot. I think they, they really start to get involved and connected to their patients. We have also needed to start a grading, um, to start a, in class kind of quizzing just because it is nice when students can complete these case analysis tools without really kind of digging in they can they can just fill in the blanks um, so we have um, we've we like to go through cases together um, for the first time and, and help them learn how to explore aquifer and then we have started incorporating quizzes just to help students um, kind of learn where they are in terms of depth versus breadth with these cases um, and I believe that's it. So Sarah, that was awesome. Uh, and I, and I love one of the innovations that you, I think you snuck in, uh, but I just want to call out is when we taught you flipped the flipped classroom. Um, and so what you've done is that you bring that lecture that provides that context and then you go around and then you assign the cases homework afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that really is another different kind of way, really awesome to take that opportunity and have them just apply what they learned real time. And the way that I call them is sort of like standardized patients, except they're virtual, right? And then they can work through and then, the, um, and then they have another way to help, help organize and articulate uh, what they did. So that was, that was 
super great. Um, one thing that I do want to show, tell everybody here, and, and we can link back, link back to this if you want to, is that it's all, the case analysis tool, as I said, can be used in any aquifer case because it kind of reflects the structure of our cases. They're only um, answers for pediatrics. So family medicine doesn't have um, them or internal medicine, but it's something that you could develop uh, at your institution if you needed to. So I'm going to turn now to Andrew, who has taken a different approach and so creative, um, and he's going to share what he has done uh, in his uh, course. So Andrew? All right. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And thank you for those kind words. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm just quickly again, I'm Andrew Parsons, and I'm an assistant professor and an internal medicine hospitalist at the University of Virginia, where I also lead our, our clinical skills course for the first and second year medical students. Uh, next slide, please. So last spring, our students, uh, third and fourth year students were pulled off of their clinical rotations during the COVID pandemic. Um, and so we were left to kind of wonder how are we gonna fill in this time and still give them the experience they need. And so our goals for um, creating the course that I'm about to describe were to provide a clinical-like experience for these third and fourth year medical students. The third year students got to do a little bit of their clerkship clinical rotations before being pulled off and the fourth year students had mostly completed that year. Um, and we wanted to provide an interactive and engaging environment and not just go completely to Zoom all day long to where um, Zoom fatigue would become quite an issue. And in the clinical skills course, again during the first and second year, we have a basic clinical reasoning curriculum and some we introduced some components of high value, high value care. So we wanted to build on that and focus on the clinical application of that since they were pulled out of the clinical environment. So next slide, please. So what we did is we created a course and the title of the course was um, Health Systems to the Bedside, High Value Care uh, 101. And the goal of this course was to kind of go from this 30,000 foot view of a health system and value-based healthcare all the way down to the bedside and to the clinician's own approach to how they practiced um, high value care. And so we created this two week elective. It was called an elective, but it was actually required um, for the third and fourth year students. So we're dealing with 300 students um, during the COVID um, learning disruption. And part of the reason we needed this was, um, like I mentioned earlier, to make sure the students um, attained the necessary credits for graduation. So we're basically taking fourth year um, electives and newly created electives and moving them into their third year. Um, and this was focused on high value care and clinical reasoning. I think those concepts align a great deal. I really think of high value care as kind of a um, core component of effective clinical reasoning. And so this was a two week, four credit course, and it was 10 half day sessions. So I'll go into that in more detail. So we used 10 um, aquifer high value care cases, and these were were perfect and fit our goals because of the clinical application that's in these cases, as well as the role model behavior where the, the clinician uh, role models high value care approach to different clinical cases. Um, and then we use just a few diagnostic excellence cases here and there, um, along with a textbook, Understanding High Value Care, that's um, by Chris Moriatis out of um, Dell Medical School in Austin. And then at the beginning, we used some AMA modules on health system science. So um, I'll go to the next slide, but the, we built this all around themes. So we, this was a 10 day course, as I said, and each day had its own theme. So we were picking and choosing from those tools to fit those um, resources around a given theme for the day. Students had independent activities in the morning where they would have to do readings from the book, um, the online modules, and then uh, and these activities, I should say, lasted between um, four to five hours on average for a given morning. And then in the afternoon, they had a one hour Zoom where they would come together with a faculty host. And we selected uh, usually multiple faculty. So one would be um, a course director, even myself or, or another course director, and then a faculty expert in the given topic or theme for the day. And Again, we're dealing with 300 students, so we didn't have all students come each day. We asked them to attend at least one of these afternoon debrief uh, journal club focused sessions because we wanted them to come prepared, having read a journal article that we felt, again, was associated with the theme, but kind of focused on the application of the foundational principles that we had 
um, they had reviewed earlier in the day. And so they came ready to discuss that journal club or that journal article. Um, and they had a faculty discussant there to, to augment that discussion. And then one of the more you know, exciting things about the course is their final project for the course was um, a shark tank. And so they came into this course in small groups of six to seven students that they, um, those were already assigned all the way um, from the beginning of medical school. And so these small groups were asked to make a proposal to improve the value of healthcare. And that's a very broad, like open-ended request. So we wanted them to think outside the box. And they had to write a one-page proposal as a group. They would work on this in the afternoon as they go through um, and then make a pitch to judges on the final day of the course on that second Friday. And many of you have probably seen the show Shark Tank, uh, the television show where entrepreneurs come and they give, you know, pitch a business idea to a group of sharks. And so ours was similar to that, but without any of the money um, involved. And so um, they would come and make that pitch to a group of judges who are who practice um, and focus their research on high value care. And then we selected based on a, a predetermined scoring rubric who um, won at the end. Next slide, please. So here's just to give you an idea of the themes. Again, we started with health system science, a so very broad, um, and then some introductory value-based healthcare, quality, safety, value, waste. And then we took it to the bedside of, to apply those principles. And uh, then the focus kind of shifted in the second week to diagnostic reasoning or clinical reasoning. And then some more specific issues like, like prevention, reproductive health, medications and end of life care before doing the shark tank on the final day. Next slide, please. And so here are um, our outcomes. Again, we've just done this once over two weeks, but um, I pulled out a question from our student evaluation to show you that it was very popular. Um, and the aquifer modules were um, literally along with the shark tank, the most um, popular part of the course. You can see about 90% strongly agreed that these were useful in learning the principles of high value care. And I've put some um, exemplar quotes down here um, that I won't read through, but they basically, they enjoyed the course and they wished that it was a standard part of the, the curriculum. Um, and they thought it was a great placeholder for their normal clinical environment that they would have otherwise been in. Next slide, please. And so, Lessons learned um, were that this flipped classroom approach was effective and popular, though um, the Zoom debrief was challenging um, with so many students. So we struggled with um, how to hold them kind of accountable for their participation. Although, um, you know, we were able, they were able to turn in the aqua, aquifer module reports that they had completed um, those and but otherwise we're relying on them to come prepared for the discussion in the debrief. Um, we plan to continue this as an elective in the fourth year because we'll be able to scale down the numbers and so I think it'll be um, uh, much more effective that way. Um, but we've integrated these flipped classroom techniques into our clinical skills course during the first and second year because of course we had to go mostly virtual um, this past fall and so um, we were able to use this approach and, and learned a number of important lessons from it um, for the rest of our curriculum. So thank you. So that was totally awesome. And uh, Andrew, it's so innovative. And I was so excited that you put this uh, course together. Um, just for the people on the, you know, on the webinar, that uh, the high value care and, and diagnostic excellence courses are available without a uh, subscription. So everybody who subscribes has access to them. So I think that's that's great. So, you know, in thinking about some of the barriers that people have, no, have uh, said, Andrew, how did you like figure out, and I'm, uh, you know, you matched the, the cases to your themes. Um, did you know the cases before or how did, you, how did you decide which aquifer cases went with each week? Yeah, so I mean, high value care is my focus. So I had thought about curriculum in the past and what themes I would wanna focus on. Um, and I was somewhat familiar with, with aquifer because I do, they kind of had the, the top, um, you know, high value care focused content um, in the market. And so I, I didn't go through every one of them myself, but I was able to go on and just by going through the learning objectives and reading kind of overviews of the different cases, I was able to match them with our themes. And so it, it worked out well that way. Great. And so for people who don't, who might, 
remember, you can go to the educator resources and you can that's where you can find the learning objectives really easily in the quick guides or um, actually in the educator guides. Uh, and we also have a case search tool. So there's a way you don't have to complete all the cases to be able to uh, do this. So um, that's that was totally awesome. And this curriculum is an educator resource. So this whole thing that Andrew just talked about is posted in Aqueduct for you all to uh, to build on. So I encourage you to go there. Um, the last little thing before we turn to your questions is just to let you in is like what do we, what we have we done at University of Washington? And so when I was a, a clerkship director, um, we had the we had a series of required topics that um, students needed to learn about pediatrics. And and one of the things that we noticed um, was that um, with changes in practice. Um, uh, students actually were not uh, getting to see a lot of babies who had fevers. Uh, so rule out sepsis, when I went through my pediatric training, uh, it was everywhere. Um, and so practices changed. And so this is still a core requirement for everybody, uh, you know, anybody who's going to take care of patients and maybe be in an emergency room uh, needs to learn. So what we did is we uh, wanted to honor that the students needed to complete all of the aquifer cases. Um, and so we decided to use the flipped classroom um, module, the active learning module having to do with fever. And so the way that this worked, these are just screenshots of some of the resources that are available, but students complete three cases beforehand. They show up and they have an uh, individual um, readiness assessment, just like a team-based learning. So they get quizzed on the content that was in the case and then here are the application exercises that we did in a one hour session. So they have a new case, that's a baby who comes in with possible urinary tract infection and then they have to decide what are they going to do um, and work through that and justify their rationales. And the discussion guide is in the facilitator's guide. So, the, so, so you as a facilitator knows what they are supposed to be talking about and then it gives you some points uh, to really cover if you don't hear that coming up in the discussion. So I disseminated th this through 18 sites, um, group discussion, individual discussion. There are many different ways that you can use this, but the facilitator guide really provided that scaffolding for all of the faculty, and we didn't have to create any new content uh, to cover this topic. So um, with that, you heard, you saw a whirlwind of different ways to flip your classroom. And so I'm gonna turn this over to Eileen Oshevsky, who is going to put your questions out um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some. So Eileen, take it away. Thanks so much. And Sherilyn, if you would unshare your screen, that'd be great and we can bring all the panelists up. So thank you everyone. Wonderful, wonderful discussion. And I apologize, the light has come through my, uh, <laughs> my window in the time that this has been going on, but let's go ahead and go forward. So um, a couple questions have come in. One, Sherilyn, at the beginning, you were talking about uh, student-led didactics using um, flipped classrooms. And um, I know Andrew gave a, a great example of that, of what you're doing with your uh, class. And I'm just wondering if there's any other examples that we could share with people about student-led didactic sessions. Right. Um, does anybody have, has anybody done that? We have done that um, uh, multiple different ways, but Sarah. Uh, we use it in a couple different ways in the course that I was speaking of specifically the pediatrics course. Um, we integrated, we have the four aquifer sessions, but then we also have four other didactic sessions where I actually produce a lecture so it's a lecture style, but we let the students, the students um, have specific diagnoses that they complete illness scripts on. And then we stop, I stop my lecture and the students answer specific questions that I might have, or I just give them an opportunity to um, teach on their topic. It, it's it, the amount of guidance that I give the students kind of varies based on the subject, how complicated the pathophysiology is. You know, sometimes I ask guiding questions to help them teach their peers. Um, and then sometimes I just say, explain the pathophysiology to your peers. But it's a really nice way to kind of, I can speak a little bit faster when I'm giving my lectures. So when we're crunched for time, it's not completely student led, but the students get to break up all the monotony of me just standing in front of them lecturing. Great. Thank you. We also had a question just about assessments. So you had mentioned some, you know, ass assessments that you can use at the beginning of a flipped classroom. 
um, seminar and wondering about some examples of those. So we have in radiology, at least we have a, an exam, a national exam that is based on our uh, cases. And certainly if the clerkship uh, utilizes that exam, that's one of the ways to assess the um, knowledge base. Great. What we've added to kind of help guide our students independent learning is, is really just a, a set, a quiz. And I really like to do polling with quizzing because I think it's helpful for students to be able to put in an anonymous answer, but then see how they compare to their classmates in terms of gauging kind of everyone knew this but me, or it seems like we were all kind of thinking about this wrong. So that polling really helps um, with those assessments. Excellent. And another question, do you have to use the entire uh, case? It's about 45 minutes, I think, to go through, 30 to 45 minutes, depending on a case. And I think some of the HVC ones are shorter, but do you have to go through the entire case to use it in a flipped classroom workshop, or can you use a cut point? Shirley? So I can answer that. Um, it, you don't. Um, so it depends on what you're trying to focus on. So going back to sort of those learning goals, if you're really interested in having the students maybe work together to create a differential diagnosis and uh, uh, defend what they're doing or focusing on management, you can have the students actually work through the case up to that point and then have them do that type of uh, activity together. So that's pretty easy. Um, it's, it's a nice way to do it um, with the case assessment tool because then they can capture their thoughts and then they come ready to do the differential diagnosis. Um, uh, if you're worried about them working forward, just change the scenario just a little bit um, and then uh, that will change your differential diagnosis and then they can think through that. Excellent. I've got a question for Sarah as well. Sarah, has, has your work been accepted by ARCPA as part of the pediatric clinical requirement? Um, so that's a good question. We actually, that wasn't our goal. So we haven't submitted it to be accepted. It's just for didactic year students. Um, so um, I, 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 don't, I don't imagine um, nothing that we have done has been specifically targeted towards that. So the way it is right now, I wouldn't want to submit it to ARCPA to, to stand in for clinical rotations. Um, but I do know that Aquifer has been really important for us in supporting um, our, our clinical rotating students um, and their, our second year students. So um, definitely potential there. Um, and one more question for Sarah, and that's about, you talked about how fun it is to grade, <laughs> but then there's a question about equitable workload arrangements for it to accommodate uh, faculty in grading. So if you had to, you know, the, the time sheets can be, the grading sheets can be time intensive. So how do you manage that with your faculty? So um, I work with a colleague, we, we share this course. So I share this course with one other colleague right now. And then we also share some of the lectures with guest lecturers. So we definitely have recognized that the workload um, on the two core faculty who are the course directors is, is pretty significant. Um, and, and for that reason, we split the grading. And then we have um, asked, uh, we actually have become interdisciplinary and a nurse practitioner um, comes in and teaches some lectures and a pediatrician um, teaches some lectures because yes, we, de we definitely realized that um, doing four aquifer cases and then grading other things and writing exams is certainly a lot more work than um, a traditional lecture style class. Excellent. I think that's it for time and for questions. So thank you everybody so much and Sherwin. I think we hand it over to you to wrap it up. Well, great. And I have one other trick about assessment that I didn't get, didn't get to share. 
all of the cases have self-assessment questions at the end. So if you, if you wanna go in, uh, that may be another place to get some questions. If you don't have time to write your own questions, just think about that as a resource. So uh, I wanna thank all of our, our panelists. I learned things today, uh, which is just so fun uh, and um, am always inspired by the creativity of everybody. Um, you know, I think Pauline, your, your course could be used as part of a, end of medical school course very easily. And Andrew, you have shown us the way to, to sort of weave this through. And Sarah, I'm so glad that the case analysis tool was gold uh, when, you, when you found it. So um, that, that's just so awesome. So um, just again, a little bit reminder, our educator resources are in Aqueduct. Um, so this is where you can go uh, to find them. Uh, and um, please let us know if uh, there are things there that you would like some help with. We've got a, a bunch of different ways to help you. There are some other resources. So um, if you want to just a quick reminder about, you know, how to teach effectively with Aquifer, we have a short case that you can actually work through and find out what it's like to, to actually do an Aquifer case. We have student resources. And again, these are the, this is the list of the um, courses that are available without a subscription. And if you're a subscriber, you have access to those as well. Um, on our website, we have a lot of other resources to sort of get, get you thinking and to figure out how to do things. We have a blog that has um, teaching perspectives. You'll see um, Sarah and Andrew um, have been contributors there. So if you wanna read more about them, we have recordings of our past webinars. Uh, some of our consortium members have talked about how they use Aquifer and then some nice support videos if you get stuck uh, trying to figure out exactly how to use part of our Aquifer learning system. If you need to talk and, and, and want to drill down to exactly what you need to do, please reach out to our relationship managers, Kate Hancock and Leah Romano. Um, they are wealth of information and can solve a lot of, of, of issues and connect you to the right people. If you'd like to talk to an educator, uh, we have a way to do that. So I'm happy to uh, spend some time talking to you about exactly what you need in your curriculum and how to make Aquifer work for you. So you can reach out through peer consults. And um, if you're not a subscriber, uh, visit our website to learn more. Uh, we're always happy to help you with that. And uh, we will make this available um, on our on-demand uh, site. And we do have another webinar coming up at the end of March. It's super exciting about integrating basic science into clinical educator, in, into clinical education. And um, I, I think it's just gonna blow your socks off. So uh, I hope that you guys come and watch because it's really innovative and fun. Um, and so I think that that's all that we have. Um, connect with us. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. And we so appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend with us today. So you all take care. Um, and uh, I, I hope that uh, you have a nice afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks.